Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University and PyTorch. In this video, we're going to look at pandas with continuous and categorical values. This is dealing with how you represent tabular data before you send it into a neural network such as PyTorch. This is the material for this part, and you can get to this notebook on GitHub through a link in the description. I'm gonna go ahead and open it up in Colab so that I can execute code if I need to in here. So we deal with categorical and continuous values a lot and the way that you represent them can be quite important. Character data can be of several different types. If it's nominal, that means there's no particular order to it. If it's things like red, green, blue, whatever, if it's a color, you always wanna to try to take the thing to some sort of numeric value. So for color, I would put in RGB values if I could, because then these are numbers that have some meaning to it. If it's the states of the United States or the provinces of Canada or another country, then you could potentially put them in alphabetical order, assign a zero for the first state and a 49 for the last state. That's one possible way. The problem is there's no particular order to those states. Alphabetic means nothing. So you, you're putting information into the model that is meaningless, which is the alphabetical order of the states. Most likely, I cannot think of a single time that that would have meaning. So what you would do maybe for the states is you could order them from GDP to lowest GDP. And now the number has something to do with how wealthy the state is, maybe unemployment rate, whatever. But the problem then is you're only encoding one actual value. Maybe you want the neural network to figure it out. So in that case, you usually use dummy variables. So you always wanna see if you can order these values in some way, then you can convert it to numeric that way. Otherwise, you've got to use dummy variables. Numeric data, there's really two types that you have here. There is interval and then there's ratio. And one way that you can tell the difference here is interval has no defined start. You also can't do magnitudes on it. So you would never say yesterday was twice as hot as it was today unless you're dealing in Kelvin, but that's, that's another story because it does have a defined start, absolute zero. Ratio are purely numeric values with a defined start. You could say that that car is going twice as fast as that car because a car can't go slower than zero miles per hour unless maybe you're, you're counting reverse as a, as a speed. So for continuous values, often you're going to convert them into z-scores. And a z-score is calculated with this formula. Essentially, it's the number of standard deviations different from the mean. And to calculate the z-score, you are going to need to know the mean. You calculate the mean like this. It's just simply an average. That's often x-bar. And then you calculate the standard deviation. The standard deviation, you take the, the data values one by one by one. You get the difference between the data value and the mean. And the order that you do this subtraction doesn't really matter because you're going to square it, which causes everything to be positive. It's absolute value like. You sum all of those, divide it. So now it's an average of those. And then you take the square root to sort of cancel out the fact that you squared every single one. So this becomes sort of an average distance from the mean of values with a unit of the standard deviation. So this shows you how many standard deviations plus or minus of the mean you are. That's essentially what a z-score does for you. Here we are going to convert the miles per gallon into z-scores or z-scores as some of my European colleagues call them. So here you have miles per gallon as z-scores and a zero would mean you are exactly at the, at the mean. Now, encoding categorical values as dummy variables, you can look at how we're, we're gonna do this. So the area column, which is basically, we just see Cs here, but there are others. There's C, D, A, B. We are going to convert that into dummies. And there's two ways you can do that. You can just do a very simple, there's four of these. I'm going to put four columns in and put a one in whichever of the dummies that it is actually occupying. The rest of the dummies will be zero. 
and then a value with all zeros, that means that it's missing, or sometimes you'll compress this down to three, and then one of the four values gets the value of zero. So here you can see this is what this looks like. This would be sort of a, a lookup table for area. If it's area A, it's going to be one, area B, and you'll notice that the rest of them are all zero. Extremely sparse. And this is why neural networks have some options built into it, like PyTorch, to handle sparse data. Because if you've got a lot of categorical values, most of them are going to be zero. So this is just getting us a lookup table for those. If we want to actually put it into the data set, then we do this, pd.getDummies, and we're passing in the area that we're using. The prefix is going to be area, so it's going to be area under bar, and then the actual value. So it's creating four columns for you. And you can then put the attach this back into your data set. And usually you'll drop the original area value because you are going to put these four columns back in and then drop the original column that was textual because you need to get all the textual values out. And here you can see area is still in, but we've added these values. So if it's a C, it's going to be area under bar C. This one has a D, so it's a D. And then you want to remove the original area column. You drop it. And now it's a little bit more numeric. You would still have to do something with this job one here. ID you'll often drop as well because that's just a increasing serial number that probably doesn't add much for prediction. And if you do have an ID field and it does do something for prediction, it is predictive, usually that's a problem because your data collection, somehow the order of these rows is important. And when you're using this model in production, you're not going to have any sort of order. Values are going to be coming in at, at all times. So you, you always want to not make use of the ID. In Kaggle, this comes up sometimes because in a Kaggle competition, the company that created the data set sometimes leaks some information into the ID field, and that's called target leak. In Kaggle, you want to exploit it. In the real world, you want to avoid it because you, you're going to create a model that's not potentially useful. And in Kaggle, utility of your model is not a goal. Getting the lowest score is, or the best score which is usually the lowest score. Like I said, there's another way that you can do this. You can also say drop first. What that will do is A, B, C, D. You are going to now have A is gone, so A becomes all zeros. And then these other values, B, C, and D, actually get one assigned to it. This eliminates a small amount of bias from the neural network, and it is more parsimonious because it is making use of everything here. I recommend generally to use this approach. And this is showing you how to encode that same data set with, with this. There's another approach called target encoding. This one can be a little bit dangerous, but I put it in for completeness. It's used a lot in Kaggle, because again, in Kaggle, the goal is not necessarily to create a model that's useful in the real world. The goal is to get as low of a, val a score as possible. What's bad about target encoding is you are using the target to encode the data. And using the target to encode the data is, is always a risky proposition because you're leaking information from the target into the data set and you don't have the target when you're doing predictions. So we're going to create a small sample data set. And this is the data set that I'm generating. We would assume that we're maybe trying to predict, predict the y value here, and we have dog as the, the first categorical value, cat, cat, cat. And then this other one is wolf, and just tiger is one. If we calculate the, the mean, we could calculate the mean y for each of these. So if, uh, if the categorical zero is cat, it's going to be cat 20% of the time, dog 80% of the time. So if we calculate the mean y according to categorical zero, we can see that dog has a mean y of 80.8 and cat has a mean of 0.2. So you can see already there's dog just tends to have higher 
higher values of y, cat tends to have lower values of y. So you could put this in as the encoding. You could put in the average of the target for the categorical. So dog, all these we would flip to 0.8s, and cat, we would flip all of those to 0.2. This is target leakage because you are having some information from the target flow into your prediction. So this leads to overfitting, potentially. However, the fact that you don't have the Y when you're trying to do predictions later on doesn't matter because you're, you've are you already got this, this table of dog was 80%, was cat was 20%, and you're, you're simply going to replace those values. Now, if you look at the mean of Y overall, you can see it's somewhere between these two. So that's, that's good. That um, means that it's, it, they're somewhat evenly distributed in their distances from the mean. Now, where this will get you into trouble is here, where we have tiger. There's only one tiger value here. So the average of the tiger Ys is not that meaningful. The average is going to be zero. But the one tiger that happened to be in here was zero. What if it's a weird tiger? So who knows? Uh, it, you're, you're basing your entire encoding of this value on the one outlier that we have. But this also indicates other problems that we might have too, because this, this row is really an outlier. That, so catam, categorical one has some problems no matter how you're encoding it, because the vast majority of them are one single value. And you've only really got one outlier that gives you any information on the tiger category. I found a technique here. You can look at the link. Let's make sure the link is still alive. It is. Highly recommend reading this article if you have interest in target encoding. But what it does is it attempts to smooth out the target. It does this by looking at how prevalent each of these are. So in Tiger, it's gonna give it a lower weighting than the rest of them. You also might wish to encode categorical values as ordinals. This means that there is an inherent order to it, and that's really all it means. So consider that you have education level from kindergarten all the way to postdoctorate. You can put these in a very specific order. This is according to US grade levels, but you could simply convert the character value high school freshman into a value such as nine. It's all nice and ordered. You might also deal with high cardinality categoricals where there's just thousands of, of these different values. In that case, you need to get creative and try to figure out other ways that you can turn those character values into numbers, even if you're using natural language processing techniques to simply turn them into like a word, like, a, like vectors, word to vec, which we'll learn about later in this course. Thank you for watching this video, and if you want to follow along with this course, please click the like button and subscribe and click the bell to be notified when I add a future video. Thank you very much.